We have some rice and something All in you the need freezer. Some, some tomato, some fruit, some rice, and shallow. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're planning to decorate this weekend. Yeah. yeah, the kids are excited about that. Mashallah, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, right. oh, we, we, kids, we, we worked on that. That's that, that was done yesterday. So now we got the Ramadan decorations. Alhamdulillah, good. Oh, go. that's awesome. Yeah, Allah. Allah. Spiritually, I feel the most ready though, that, which is awesome. So it's okay about the other stuff. <laughs> that's wonderful. Mashallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Sheikh Ibrahim, what about you guys up in Canada? Uh, we've had a lot of drama because uh, they shut everything down literally like the other day, like they waited till after Easter and they shut everything down and we had to fight to be allowed to open the masjid a little bit at least. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of drama on that front, but Alhamdulillah, we're hopefully set to open, inshallah. Everyone, we're, we're, we're live, Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, to everyone that's tuning in, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Uh, alhamdulillah rabbil uh, alameen this is you know it came so fast subhanallah um you know it's been a, a long year obviously but at the same time here we are uh, one year uh, later our, our second uh, covid ramadan but this one alhamdulillah things are a bit better inshallah ta'ala opened up a bit uh, except for canada which sheikh ibrahim was just uh dishing uh, on so uh we're we're making dua for everyone bidnillahi ta'ala but just to set this up inshallah uh, this Ramadan, of course, our theme is Ramadan with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and uh, meeting Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What it would be like to meet the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is going to be a Ramadan series, along with Quran thirty for thirty, uh, which has a sira focus, which Sheikh Abdullah Oduru has deemed uh, tafsira. So we'll be doing tafsira, inshallah ta'ala, nightly as well, and we're looking forward to getting started just in a couple of days, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, with that, as we go into Ramadan, bi'ithnillah. And of course, um, you know, throughout this, this period, we'll also have the, the webathon at the last 10 nights, inshallah ta'ala, going into the last 10 nights. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to allow us to live to see Ramadan and to achieve all that is to be achieved within Ramadan and to be pardoned and forgiven and attain his mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala, in Ramadan and to develop lifelong habits in accordance with the way of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that we can carry with us outside of Ramadan. Allahumma amin. And inshallah ta'ala, one more reminder that the Greet Ramadan with Sadaqah is still live. Um, if you uh, donate at the link, inshallah ta'ala, below, uh, your donation will be processed, inshallah ta'ala, on the first day of Ramadan so that you get the ajr of giving within Ramadan. So please do, inshallah ta'ala, get ahead of it. And uh, we, we appreciate always the support that we get uh, from the community. You know, it was really overwhelming last year that people still gave despite the uncertainty of the pandemic, alhamdulillah, and we were able to actually grow as yaqeen uh, to do more. So everything we do is uh, free resources, inshallah ta'ala. All of our resources are free. And the more that the community uh, continues to support us, the more that we're able to give back bidnillahi ta'ala uh, through these uh, free resources. Uh, I want to welcome the, the panel that we have today, inshallah. Uh, first of all, I just have to say Sheikh Abdullah Oduru in like super high def. He looks like he's got like a TV camera. It's my first time seeing him like, I mean, he's always, mashallah, nurun ala nur and just just uh, full of joy. But uh, man, you've come a long way from last year's Quran 30 for 30 with the curtains blowing in the back and, you know, <laughs> the, the fan. And we already got a face palm. We didn't have, even have to wait for Quran 30 for 30. <laughs> to get a face palm out of Sheikh Abdullah, alhamdulillah. But his camera is like super high def. So I think the rest of us should probably just, you know, just let him talk the whole time, right? But alhamdulillah, uh, blessed to have uh, Sheikh Abdullah Aduru, uh, Ustada Lubna Mullah, who is uh, coming to us from California, walillah alhamd, um, always uh, a pleasure and always a great benefit and great blessing and great lessons in tarbiya in particular. Uh, and Sister Sara Sultan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, who has been a pioneer of the trauma series at Yaqeen and um, has, has put out just so much, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, through her writing and through her uh, lectures and various webinars that, that we've had uh, with her. May Allah reward you uh, for filling such an important void in our community. And Sheikh Ibrahim Hindi, our Canadian, uh, our token Canadian for the webinar. Uh, alhamdulillah, we've got a Canadian with us. Uh, Sheikh Ibrahim, of course, well-known in Canada and um, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, 
uh, joined Yaqeen full time recently, and we're just blessed to have him there as a religious director in Canada. And I'm looking forward to hearing all of your insights, Bidnanahi Ta'ala. So welcome to the entire uh, panel. Happy to be here. And <laughs> Sheikh Ibrahim, uh, how's Canada? Tell us about Canada first. We caught the beginning well, of the webinar. So do you want to like switch the tune on Canada? <laughs> well, like you guys know, we all live in igloos and uh, our money is worthless. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. I can't wait, inshallah, for you guys to be able to visit us, hopefully after all this COVID stuff is over. Um, love to show you around uh, the best halal food scene in North America is in Toronto. So uh, we have a lot of secrets here. That's one of them. Yeah, I got to get one of those beaver tails. What do they call those beaver tail things? <laughs> <laughs> oh, beaver man, those tail. things are good. That's my cheat day. <laughs> <laughs> you got to try a shawarma poutine too. Okay. Bismillah. Put a bismillah on it. <laughs> All right. So it's normal lawn prep and we're already talking about food. <laughs> Diverted <laughs> quite a bit from the uh, from the Ramadan prep. So, Bismillah. Let's get started. And Inshallah, just to mention one more thing, Mufti Abdurrahman Wahid will be coming um, to join us uh, soon. Inshallah, Taala. He is at a janaza uh, for one of his friends' fathers. May Allah reward him and may Allah have mercy on uh, the brother that passed away. Inshallah, he said he'll join at some point. So we'll look forward to having him when we can. Inshallah. So a Ramadan like his, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want us to just um, sort of start off because each one of you, inshallah, is going to be connecting a Ramadan uh, experience that would be closest to his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I think it's important for us to just say that whether it comes to ibadah, the realm of worship or the realm of character, the realm of just being, you know, the best servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the best slave of Allah, the best, uh, the most pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the supreme standard. And so anytime we become more connected to Allah, we become more beloved to Allah and we become closer in resemblance than to the beloved one of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not just this example for us to marvel at, but he is uswatun hasana liman kana yarjullah wal yawmul akhir. He is, in, you know, the, the supreme example for those that desire, that long for Allah and goodness on the day of judgment and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frequently. And so the more we remember Allah, the more we worship Allah, the more we seek to refine our character, the more we remove those things that are undesirable from our lives, uh, the backbiting, the, uh, the, the gossip, the wasted time, uh, the closer we become to Allah because the closer we resemble the most beloved person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is our messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I want to just start off, inshallah, and then we'll, we'll start with, uh, with, with each one of you, inshallah. Uh, we'll start with Sister Sara. I want to start off with something that I noted um, you know, a few years ago that I find very profound, that Ramadan engages all of the articles of Iman. It engages all of the articles of faith. It engages your belief in Allah. It engages your belief in the angels. It engages your belief in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the messengers because you are following the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and fasting the way that all of the prophets used to fast. It engages uh, Al-Iman Bil-Kutub, the belief in the books because it is Shahr Al-Quran, it is the month of Quran. And we honor uh, ourselves by the recitation of the Quran. Um, in our lives, particularly in this month. And it is, of course, what the Prophet ﷺ said, the month in which all of the divinely revealed books came down. All of them were revealed in this month of Ramadan. SubhanAllah, the Torah, the Injil, were all revealed in this month of Ramadan. And the Qur'an was revealed, of course, on Laylatul Qadr. And this is Shahrul Qur'an. So it engages the belief in the, in, in the books and particularly the belief in the book, in the ultimate book, the Qur'an. It engages our belief in the akhirah, in the hereafter, right? Uh, because uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the Hadith Qudsi that Allah has said all of the children, all of the deeds of the children of Adam are for him, except for fasting. Fasting is for me and I reward accordingly, meaning it is a specific deed on the day of judgment, a specific reward on the day of judgment, because it is such a sincere deed and such a rewardable uh, deed in the sight 
uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it engages Al-Qadr. It engages divine decree. Laylatul Qadr is in Ramadan. And our uh, decree for the year will be uh, written ta'ala on Laylatul Qadr. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, for the good of it. And so it engages all of our pillars of faith, all of our articles of faith. And we basically see that the Prophet وسلم, everything that he did outside of Ramadan that made him the magnificent person that he was والسلام, in Ramadan, he just took it to the next level. And so when we compare ourselves to the Prophet وسلم, we're striving to be you know, anything uh, of what he was والسلام, throughout the year. But in Ramadan, you know, he just took it to the next level. And so I think the lesson that we learn is proportionality, right? If the Prophet Sallallahu increased in this particular deed, which we were already lagging behind in, then we should increase in that deed, right? And the things that were the features of the Ramadan of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be the features of our Ramadan as well, except for one thing. And it's very interesting. Um, and that is uh, the abandonment of sin. The Prophet ﷺ was never foul. The Prophet ﷺ was never one to engage in the ma'asiyah and in, in the disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was never one alayhi salatu was salam to, uh, to, to engage in those deeds that would bring about the displeasure of Allah. And that is actually our starting point that we have to see kutiba alaykum al-siyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Fasting has been prescribed upon you the way it was prescribed on those who came before you so that you may gain taqwa, so that you may become more pious, conscious of Allah and abandon those sins that are a barrier between you and Allah. What's, what's just so powerful about that is that what that tells us is that what is preventing us in excelling in those good, in, in those good deeds is in fact the presence of those bad deeds. What is preventing us from taking that next step is our insistence upon that regressive step. And so I just think always, and inshallah ta'ala, I'll then pass it on to Sister Sara, um, you know, about the saying of Imam Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah when he was asked about why we can't pray Qiyamul layl why we can't pray the night prayer. And he said, uh, don't disobey him during the day and he will wake you up at night. Don't disobey him during the day and he will wake you up at night. And so the ultimate ingredient, the first ingredient was that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam was not one to engage in the disobedience of Allah and therefore, he was always oriented to the obedience of Allah. And so when the month of Allah comes, the month of Ramadan comes, then it's just, you know, you're kicking into next gear rather than starting the car. And for a lot of us, we're just starting, right? And so how do we start? And inshallah ta'ala with that, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll pass it to Sister Sara, uh, bin Allah ta'ala, to get us started. Jazakallah khairan. Um, for the all-star lineup here, mashallah. I'm excited to prep for my personal Ramadan and listening to, to everybody's tips, um, inshallah. So the one that I wanted to focus on uh, for today is, you know, I think when we're talking about transitioning into Ramadan, a lot of us naturally think about uh, the increase in external acts of worship, which are very, very, very important. Um, But the one that I wanted to focus on today is more of an internal act of worship, and that's important as well. Um, And so, you know, this particular one is one that can allow for um, spiritual, mental, and emotional growth, inshallah. So it, it frees up space in your life for what's important. And it's based on the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where um, uh, in sitting in the masjid, a man, before, before he walks into the masjid, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that a man from the dwellers of paradise will walk in now. Um, and then a man walked in. And this happened three times. And so one of the companions of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abdullah ibn Amr, you know, was very curious. This, it's three times Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that this person is a dweller of paradise. What does he do that is so unique that makes him from amongst those who has such a high status in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And so he decided, you know, he requested to spend three, um, three nights with this man um, and the man accepted and he goes to his home. And what really stood out to him was that nothing stood out to him, right? That, that the external acts of worship were not, you know, he was doing all of the things that he's supposed to do in terms of salah, in terms of things like that, but there wasn't something 
that that was really, really, you know, like a, a huge increase in uh, in typical acts of worship. And so, you know, he addressed him directly and he said, Rasulullah you know, mentioned you as a dweller of paradise three times and each time it was you who walked through those doors. You know, what what is it about you that gave you such a status that led you to deserve such a status? And the man said, you know, what you saw, like my deeds are nothing more than than what you saw. And so Abdullah ibn Amr walks away and then he calls him back and he says, you know, my deeds are nothing more than what you saw, but the only thing that I do that, you know, that, that might be something special, right? Um, the only thing that I do is that I don't hold a grudge against any Muslim or envy anyone for the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted them, right? This, this idea of like husn of dhan, right? Thinking, giving people the benefit of the doubt, not holding on to ill intent in one's heart, that if somebody has done something that has hurt you, that has offended you, to not hold on to that. And perhaps one of the ways that he did that is through this idea of giving benefit of the doubt, of being able to see this from a, from a light, a positive light, a positive intent. Um, and, you know, another hadith of Rasulullah that stood out to me about this, this concept is when the Rasulullah is, is um, describing uh, the Kaaba, subhanAllah. And he's describing the Kaaba in, you know, such beautiful ways as, you know, how pure is your fragrance, how great you are, how incredible is your sanctity and things like that. And then in the end, he says that the sanctity of the believer is greater to Allah than your sanctity. And then he ends the hadith by saying, to assume nothing but good of the believer, right? In, com in comparison to the Kaaba. So it tells you the significance of, you know, how, how much the Rasul was encouraging us to do this, subhanAllah. And so um, it's something that, you know, some of the questions that come to my mind when I'm thinking about this for this upcoming Ramadan, right? Is what would you be able to focus on if you weren't holding on to that grudge? If you weren't struggling with those negative thoughts about that person who said something that bothered you the other day, if you weren't so busy searching for possible ways that people might be intending to hurt you, right? If you could let go of that, imagine how much space in your heart and in your, in your mind and in your time is freed up for other things, right? SubhanAllah. Um, and the Rasul you know, talked about this, you know, my intent in sharing this is that it truly makes things better between people, but it truly is so much better for you, right? Husn al is for you. It's not for that other person, it's for you. But in reconciling things between you and that other person, that is for you as well. The Rasul said to his companions that, you know, shall I not tell you, you know, shall I tell you about something that's better in degree than extra fasting, prayer and charity? extra fasting, prayer and charity, what could be better than those things, right? And the Rasulullah said, reconciliation between people, making things right between people and having positive intentions that you attribute toward other people helps to make things right between you. One of the rewards of, of Jannah, subhanAllah, one of the rewards that we, inshallah, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his mercy grants us Jannah, one of the rewards of that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove what is in our chests in terms of resentment toward other people. That's a reward of Jannah, right? So what if we could, you know, to some extent gain that for ourselves this Ramadan, right? And so, you know, some of the things to ask yourself about this, right, is, you know, somebody has done something. Is there another way that I could possibly be interpreting this? What might be going on in that person's life that led to that moment that hurt me? right? Is it possible that I've been hurt by other people? And so because of that, I'm searching for possible harm um, in, in this particular situation. Is any good going to come from me attributing negative or ill intent from this person? And what could I do instead if I let that go and I moved forward from that? And so I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, to increase us in the ability to give people the benefit of the doubt, to increase us in the ability to attribute positive intent to them and to allow that to be a purification for us this Ramadan and after Ramadan as well, inshallah. Barakallah, Fiki. And, you know, subhanAllah, right away, by the way, what came to my mind is the Sha'ban, the Sha'ban regimen more than anything else is clearing your heart 
making space for Allah. And uh, I think that is something, just the connection between uh, shahna and shirk, right? And I talked about this a few weeks ago. Um, it was something one of my teachers had shared with me a long time ago, and I never forgot it, the connection between shahna and shirk, uh, which is malice and shirk, which is polytheism, to associate another god. Um, and he said, shirk tubulti ruddin wa shahna tahliq ruddin. Um, shirk invalidates faith um, and shahna hatred shaves it as the prophet some said because it's born out of envy and, and things of that sort and i think what you just mentioned is very profound your opportunity cost you know um the the, the greatest thing you're missing out on is not you know your your peace of mind is not you know i'm not able to enjoy this time with my family i'm not able the, the greatest thing you're missing out on is you're not able to really enjoy your worship because you're so immersed in your your hatred and um you know and and uh what could even be your righteous anger sometimes uh, about something that was done uh towards you and relinquishing that grudge is really removing a poison from the heart subhanallah um and one other thing husna dhan in allah and husna dhan in the people husna dhan in allah is actually directly connected to that because your husna dhan with the people includes a natural element of, you know, if there is something I'm missing, or if they are indeed as, you know, uh, if they are indeed as bad as some say they are, that, that uh, some, there's a voice inside of me telling they're that bad, or that this was done, or this was the intent, then my husn of in Allah is that Allah is not going to let the edge of that go to waste. Allah won't let the reward of that go to waste. And so there's a connection in the husn of in Allah, the good expectation of Allah, and the good assumptions that you have of people that you know, the, the biggest fear of having good assumption in people is what? They'll take advantage of that. But if you have husn al in Allah, they can't take advantage of that because you'll take advantage of it because you'll get the reward uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with anything that happens there. So Jazakumullah khair for that beautiful reflection. No, you know, as you said that, I'm sorry, just to add one thing that came to mind from like a brain perspective, the connection between like husn al of people and husn al of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you're scanning your life for ways people might hurt you, you're going to end up scanning your life for ways that you're going to, you know, feel a sense of distrust from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, right? Like if your brain is in protective mode constantly, that can even affect the ability to trust um, and, you know, expect good of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. So, so that's what came to mind as you were sharing that. Jazakumullah khairan. Oh. And that's a beautiful connection because when you have bad expectations of people, we mentioned that the qadr is part of our iman. So you have bad expectations of what's going to come from what Allah ultimately has control in, right? So that's the beautiful connection within it. And I like how you mentioned, uh, uh, subhanAllah, you know, not having any grudges with people, you know, subhanAllah. And that, that's, that's one thing I remember one of my mentors told me a long time ago. And he said, Ramadan is when I send texts out, call people. You know, and I ask, is there anything in the hearts, you know, saying if there's anything that I've done, if there's a possibility of one person, you know, I send a text or I call, it was even before a text, it was, you know, I just call them and see if there's any, anything in the heart. And if there is, and we can, you know, talk it out, subhanAllah. Uh, so that's, that's very important. And it takes, it takes the effort, you know, and that's what, you know, Sheikh Ramon was saying about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was kind of, you know, Ramadan, can I ajwa the mayakun, as the companion said that he was the best, that he, best manners. So it takes digging deep within yourself and making that call or sending that text for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not easy, but it's not supposed to be uh, easy. Allah knows best. Sadhu Lubna or Sheikh Ibrahim. Ah, mashallah, Mufti Abdul Rahman Wahid. Ahlan, Habibi, Kif al Hal. How are you? How are you, Sheikh? Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mufti Saab, we know you just came from. Um, uh, Janaza and may Allah Azza wa have mercy on the, the one who passed away um, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for being a part of that. Can you share who he was so we can make dua for him inshallah so the people can Yes, uh, he was one of my, our close friend he, his mother passed away, his name was Basif, his mother passed away when he was maybe like in 7th grade or 8th grade so this person took care of him all his life, he was his uncle his mom's brother and uh, he got diagnosed with cancer a few months ago and his health started deteriorating in the last week or so. And so they were expecting it, but it happened very quickly. And he passed away Friday early morning between um, Tahajjud and Fajr Salah. Oh, yeah. And um, so today it was a janazah. And, uh, you know, it's just, 
it's, I don't know how to put it in words, but it's the first janazah in our institution since my brother passed away six months and four days ago. So it was kind of, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm on here. So inshallah, we'll say a few words, but it was kind of difficult because it's the first time we bought a body to our our building since that time. So it just brought memories of that feeling. But alhamdulillah, Allah gave him the jannah of the He was a sick man. And um, I always, my, when, we, when we put my brother in his grave, uh, my older brother said like, he was the youngest among us, and now he's the oldest because he's 33 years old now. <laughs> so this, this old, this, I mean, sometimes we're old, 65, 70 years old. Who would not? Who wouldn't want to be young again? Who wouldn't want, you know, full hair on their head again? Who wouldn't want to be? And the moment you pass away, inshallah, you go to Jannah. You're 33 years old. You know, the age of Jannah. So, I mean, you know, these things start coming. But inshallah, he's in, he's he's in a better place. But I'm not sure if we are. But inshallah, we'll be fine. Rahimahullah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on him and have mercy on your brother. Allah allow them to be from the people of Jannah to Thirdos and allow us to, to be joined with them. Allahumma ameen. Zakallah khair. Um, it's hard to sort of transition back. Mufti Saab, how about you just, while we have you, inshallah, <laughs> share, share your words. Your heart is in a good place with the night, Tyler, and you can share oh, some oh. one prep, inshallah, for us. So Sister Sara just spoke about the importance of husn al in Allah and husn al in the people as well. Um, and, and removing from our hearts grudges, removing from our hearts things that would prevent us from immersing ourselves in Ramadan. So would you have anything to sort of build on that, inshallah? What's your, what's your Ramadan prep tip for us? All right. Uh, Sheikh Umar, I mean, it's good you brought that up. I would, something I was working on last Ramadan, and I'm so grateful that I started working on it last Ramadan, and uh, it helped me out. This is something that really helped me out when my brother passed away um, on October 5th. One of the things you, you heard from people was that don't find yourself alone. You know, don't be driving alone in the car and don't ever see yourself alone in the house because that's when it's really going to hit you. Always be around people. And that is true to a point. Definitely it's true. But I found that the most comforting moments was when I was alone. Because nobody really understands what you're going through other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he put, it, he put you through it. So yes, you can speak to this person. When you speak to people around you, it makes a difference. Just getting it off of your shoulder, just speaking, letting, just venting, even talking to people around, oh, you don't understand how much difficulty it is, this, that. It just helps just speaking about it. And we understand that it's a factual thing. Even in counseling, we let the person speak. Once the more they speak, the better they feel. I feel that um, in Ramadan, there's so many collective ibadat, things we're doing together all the time. So we eat suhoor together, we pray salah together, inshallah we'll be in the masjids, then we go for we go to work, we come back, we prepare for iftar together, then we maghrib, then isha. Every, like, Ramadan is like a collective month where everyone's together and it's great. But my tip for this Ramadan to all of us is schedule a time of your day in which you are alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that time that you're alone, schedule this to be on your to-do list. I mean, there's so many things. People will tell different variations, different ulama will say different things. This is the top 10 uh, things to do when you're alone. Dua, this, that, all these are amazing ibadat. But for me personally, and anyone who is going through something similar, like going through difficulties, whatever it is in your life that you're going through, um, the most comforting thing to me, of course, reading books and learning knowledge and speaking to people is comforting, but the most comforting thing for me, and I, will, I want to continue in Ramadan, is just speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's called munajat. I started this last Ramadan, you know, even though I was really weak at it, but it really helped me out after my brother passed away because you started this habit and it, you could bank on it after because, you know, you just go right back into it and then you just cry in front of Allah. You just open up your heart in front of Allah. And he understands what you're going through. And so I would say that this idea of, you don't, have, you, don't need, you don't need to learn du'as, you don't need to learn certain words. You just need to speak. He's your friend. He understands what you're going through. Just speak to him in whichever manner you're speaking to him in. It comes in hadith of a person who's speaking to Allah and he says, oh Allah, you're my slave and I'm your Lord. You know, like he literally switched it up. And Allah forgave him because of that, just because it was the way he spoke to Allah. Iqbal Rahmatullah he says, it's a long poem, but you know, something that we can reflect over. He says something where what we're going through similarly. 
he says, Dunya ki mahfalon se ukta gya hu ya rab. Kya lutf anjuman ka jab dil hi buj gya ho. Shorash te baakta hu. Dil doond ta hai mera. Aisa sukut jis par taqreer bhi fida ho. Marta hu khamoshi par. Ya arzu hai meri. Daman me kuh hai. Kuh ke ek chota sa jomp ra ho. Azad fikr se hu uzlat me. Din guzaro. Dunya ke gham ka. Dil se kanta nikal gya ho. He says, Dunya ki mahfalon se ukta gya ho, ya Rab. Oh Allah, I'm just tired. I feel like I can't breathe. I've heard this like three three times in the last week from people. I feel like I'm suffocating, even though you're in the middle of everybody. You have everyone around you, but I feel like I can't breathe. And this is what Iqbal is saying over here. Oh Allah, I feel like I can't breathe. He said, kya lutf anjuban ka jab dil hi puj gya ho. He said, what, is, what benefit is there in this crowd, in this audience, when you're restless from inside? He said, oh Allah, I'm trying to run away from this. You know, not that I have to avoid, of course, a person, the Prophet said, a person who meets people and his patience, who, and he exercises or she exercises patience on the difficulties they receive is better than the one who's alone. But still Allah is saying to the Prophet وَتَبَتَّلِ تَبْتِيلًا You know, when you get done with everything, O Prophet of Allah, please spend some time alone, alone with me. And the Prophet would yearn for that time where he would be all alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would not compromise anything on that time. This is only for him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the people of the past, they were the, the you know, they were the people that brought the, the best, most justice and they brought so much greatness to this world. But one thing they never left, Salah al Ibrahim they never missed time at night speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, as a sukut, just per taqreed bi fidaho. Shaykh Omar, this is a crazy line. He says, I'm ser- searching for such silence in which even speeches would envy. So you have speeches that affect and motivate you, right? You're like, man, I heard that speech and I, like it motivated me. Someone watched the new series that's coming out of Sheikh Omar, like, yeah, that really pumped me up. But he's saying, I'm actually looking for such silence where even speeches would envy, like, whoa. How did this have such an effect on this person? Khalas, he goes on by saying different things that, you know, people that understand Urdu, Fakat Fahima, Khalas, you know, Sheikh Umar, you don't understand it, so it's not, I can't do anything about it. And another place he says, Uqabi ruh jab bedar hoti hai jawano mein, nazar aati hai unko manzil asmano mein. See, once you have this spirit of this falcon, which is, it's roaming around everywhere, it's a public bird, but at the same time, one of the things about this bird is, it finds time alone, all alone somewhere. If you develop this quality, Iqbal Allah says, then you can see your destination above the skies, meaning you could see the light beyond the tunnel. You can envision things in a much different light. I found that if we all can work on this quality in any way, it's gonna be it's gonna be very awkward at the beginning. You're sitting down all alone, but then you start speaking to Allah as if you could really, really like feel that Allah is listening to you. It's a different feeling. And just, you know, everything is in your heart. Today, we know how to share our problems on social media to people all around us, but we just don't know how to speak to the one who is the solver of our problems. So let's present present our problems in front of him so he can solve it. And I'll conclude by saying, the people of the past, they were they just knew how to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They never really asked Allah for too much, but they just knew how to speak to him. One scholar, he used to say, in his every single day in his munajat, he used to say, His name is Abu Sulaiman Darani. He used to say, Oh Allah, if you ask me, if you present my sins in front of me, then I will present all the pages of Quran and Hadith about your forgiveness. So oh Allah, come on, my sins, your forgiveness, they don't even come close to each other. Then, oh Allah, if you present me by saying to me that, oh, where's your tawbah? Like, yes, I will forgive you, but where's your tawbah? Then I will present your generosity to you. So, oh Allah, you also said you're generous. Then he says, oh Allah, if, if I know I'm, I'm not worthy of Jannah, but if I end up in Jahannam, I will tell the people of Jahannam that I love you. Oh Allah, I never understood this until when I went through with my brother, where people are looking at you, people that are not Muslims, atheists, are looking at you like, okay, this is really going to break this person. And you look at them in their eyes and say, I love Allah more now. I don't care what happens, right? And those people cannot believe it. Our, our relationship is completely different. So we just say, oh Allah, it doesn't matter what you put me through. 
Anni uhibbuk, I still love you. This is a conversation I, I urge everyone to start developing in this collective month of ours. Still find time where you're sitting alone and you're speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will find that this will be the powerhouse for your whole day. You will not get tired if you look, you look forward to this and then you build upon it for the rest of the day. I hope I never took more time than what was allotted to me, even though I do it all the time. Sheikh Abdul Rahman, you, uh, you really touched our hearts uh, in a way I, I don't think you can imagine. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on the, the dear brother that you buried today and your dear beloved brother that uh, you had to endure the pain of bearing uh, uh, six months back. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Jazakum al-khair for that beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful reminder. Allahumma, I mean, I mean, no, you know, I found it so powerful the way that you were talking about um, taking your emotion and making it into a dua to help you connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I was thinking about um, Nuh alayhi salam and how in the Quran, Allah, you know, he's described as saying, I'm so defeated, so help me, right? Like he takes this emotion and he turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and seeks help from the one who can, who can help him. And I, you know, in, in hearing my, like my clients share their emotions in therapy, and that's one of the pieces of therapy that's supposed to be healing, right? So can you imagine the healing that can also come from sharing those emotions with the healer, right? The source of healing, subhanAllah. And so it's such a beautiful reminder. Jazakumullah khairan for sharing that. Sheikh Umar, we'll, have a, we'll go on a phone call after and I'll, I'll translate those poems for you, okay? <laughs> it wouldn't be, it would not be a, a Mufti Abdurrah, Abdurrahman uh, moment without uh, an Iqbal poem in Urdu. And um, yeah, and then making us cry and then making us laugh. Like that just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same. So I just, <laughs> may Allah reward you and um, yeah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. Um, and by the way, I, I'm wearing the vest in the Ramadan series, so. Um, I mean, you know, people have been asking me, um, is Sheikh Umar, like, is he like a <laughs> secret desi or not? I'm like, he's just a wannabe, you know, like, we, <laughs> that's all it is. And so, and this, is a, this, is a, this is something, this is a, it's a, the marketing team put him to this, I can tell you that for sure. I'll tell the story, I'll tell the story of the, of, of the vest, uh, because you never gifted me with one and, and you guys never gifted me with one. Um, so I'll have to tell the story. I got it from a random nikah as I was going in to record meeting Muhammad Salaam. So I said, you know what? This looks pretty nice. I'm going to keep it on. So you never got me one because you you obviously don't find me worthy, um, you know, of your poetry or of your of your clothes. Uh, but alhamdulillah, someone else gave me one, Sheikh. So we're good. So now I can I can pretend I can come to Miftah and I can don the vest. I can uh, blend no, off the turban. You, we, have you, we have to get you a turban that goes seven times around your head, not six. <laughs> it has to be seven. It has to be, it has to be big enough. Sheikh Abdullah, don't do those face palms. I, I'm going to see you in Ramadan, inshallah. I'll see you in Ramadan. <laughs> He's doing his face palms in high def right now, like super high def. And with that, we, we're just, you know, we're, we still got a lot of time to go. Bismillah. So with that, <laughs> Sheikh Abdullah, tafadl, mashkuran. You're on mute, Sheikh. Mm. Oh, this is not I'm good now? You're good, yeah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu wa sallam, wa barak, ala nabiyyina Muhammad, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi jama'in, ma barak. Just to kind of capitalize on what uh, Sheikh Abdul Rahman was mentioning, uh, was, 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 was very beautiful in regards to, you know, just reminding me of, uh, uh, which will come at the end of Ramadan, but does not mean that it's only confined to the end of Ramadan, or the last 10 days of Ramadan, the Itikaf and Itikaf is to be stationary or devotional worship within a place, uh, primarily the masjid. I remember one of my, subhanAllah, one of my best friends that I was studying with in Medina, uh, subhanAllah, he got accepted to Medina, you know, when he was around 17, 18. Comes from a very strong family, mashallah, tabarakallah. And uh, I remember he gave me advice, you know, to just go to a, when you go to the masjid, because we used to go to the haram and make it to kaf. So as soon as we get to the door of the haram, you're like, okay, salam alaikum to our cats. Go off somewhere where no one knows you and there's no distractions. You know, so that was that was huge advice for me because, but it was normal for him, but it was subhanAllah, it really touched me when he did that because as soon as he did it, I knew what he meant. As soon as he shook my hand and looked at me, we traveled four hours and I'm like, oh, okay, got you, right? So 
it was subhanAllah, I'll never forget it was in Mecca, was, subhanAllah was the uh, the last year Shaykh Ibn Taymin was uh, giving the halakat, giving the, the lessons in Mecca. And, you know, every time he would speak, every couple of, you know, <clears throat> minutes, uh, you know, he was coughing and things of that nature, rahimahullah ta'ala. But it was an experience that after that I was hooked, you know, it was really, itikaf was my, you know, subhanAllah, my, my go-to, uh, particularly because of that reason. Uh, of spending time alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and conversing with him through the salat, through reciting the Quran, through asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not being distracted at all. And I think that is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful point that he mentioned and guideline and, and point in, uh, for us to, to really ponder over and just ask ourselves how much alone time on purpose for Allah have we spent. Uh, that's what I want to talk about roughly uh, not exactly the alone time, but uh, what would get us there, inshallah ta'ala. As we know, the beautiful hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is actually three. And it's easy for us to memorize. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said uh, three, th three hadith in Bukhari and some Bukhari and Muslim. He said, Man qama ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. Man qama ramadana imanan wa ihtisaban, ghufira lahu ma taqaddama min dhambi. وَمَنْ قَامَ لَيْلَةَ الْقَدْرِ إِيمَانًا وَاحْتِسَابًا غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِ So there's three things here. In these two hadith, the Prophet ﷺ, the first one he said, whoever fasts the month of Ramadan with firm belief and conviction and hoping for his reward, then he will, his previous or her previous sins will be forgiven. Second hadith, who stands the month of Ramadan with conviction hoping for his reward, then his or her previous sins will be forgiven. Third hadith, whoever stands the night of Qadr, okay, Laylat al-Qadr, with conviction and hoping for his reward, his or her previous sins will be forgiven. So we see just the first part of the hadith is something that is slightly different, but it's all in the month of Ramadan. So the Prophet ﷺ is talking about standing in the month of Ramadan, which is prayer which is some of the scholars mention is in another hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to desire for the, the, the Muslims to stand in prayer. And primarily the scholars mentioned this being Tarawih. When Abu Huraira mentioned this, that it was him hoping for the companions to stand, but he didn't want to make it obligatory upon them. So as, a, as an encouragement, he mentioned this hadith, Man qama Ramadana iman wa Whoever was to stand in the month of Ramadan in prayer, primarily Tarawih, with full conviction, hoping for his reward, then he or she will be forgiven. Their previous sins will be forgiven. So this is beautiful because when we look at Tarawih, it's something that should, you know, looking at the Jama'ah and looking at the congregation, especially this year, for those of us that are able to make it to the masjid or hear those that are able to go, you will see people that you haven't seen in a while. And you will see all of your brothers and sisters and you're all praying together, listening to the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being recited. And also in fasting this month of Ramadan and standing in the night of Qadr. But I want to touch on primarily the second part of this hadith, because that was the first part. There's three. The second part is where he says, Imanan wihtisaban. And subhanAllah is beautiful when reading the works of Ibn Qayyim Jawzi, ta'ala, when he talks about this concept of Iman and ihtisab. Even though I translated it as conviction on a yaqeen platform, alhamdulillah, it seems like the kulli maqam and maqal and hadal maqal. So, you know, uh, we could say conviction and it is that which is, it pushes you to do an action of khair to Allah, to your creator. You know, and that's the belief in Allah. Firstly, knowing who he is, knowing that he is one and he is not like any other. And he is a creator of all things. Therefore, everything other than him is creation. And naturally, the ingrained quality of yearning for one deity, that is what is ingrained within all of creation. And that iman is that which one needs in order to pull through. And that's why he says, iman and wihtisaban. In Arabic, they call this mafrun li The reason that they did this action was for this purpose. So it was iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conviction, trust, honor, love, all of these aspects of worship this Iman and Allah. So what I like to say is this is your motivation. This is what got you up in the middle of the night. This is what after, inshallah, this won't be all of us, but the reality is after you made had your huge iftar and, you know, you unbuckle your belt buckle, you go to the extra hole, you know, the, and you, you know it's got to get a little bigger. And you're like, okay, we got to go to Tarawih. 
but you're still getting up to go to Tarawih. It's that Iman that motivated you to do so, inshallah. It's that Iman that pushed you to go and pray Tarawih with the Jama'ah. Because hopefully when you are there, you have, which is next, the destination. So we talk about the motivation and your destination. That which pushed you to do an action is your Iman al-wajib. And Iman al-mustahab, the Iman, the initial belief that you have, I believe that God created me. And I believe also that Allah made this obligatory being this Ramadan. And I believe also that this Tarawih will make me a better person. If I go and pray Tarawih in the congregation or I pray at home with myself, as the Prophet did by himself or with his family, this is something that Allah loves. You know, subhanAllah, I was, I, was, I was at a public place the other day and it reminded me of my children and all of us have faced this. You know, you, I saw the guy in the aisle and he was with his children and his children were like, Baba, look at, Lee, look at me, look at me, look at what I'm doing. And they were performing an action. They're looking. So they wanted their dad to see them because they wanted their dad to be proud of them. Well, we as all ibadullah, we want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to see us. We know that he sees us at all times, but we want him to be happy. We want him to be pleased with us. We want to go to Jannah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa radu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased with, with him, what he has given them. So this iman is something that is very, very important for us that when we have this motivation and we have this belief in Allah that he's made it obligatory or he's made it uh, you know, recommended for us and that we will receive the reward, that is where the ihtisab comes from. The ihtisab, as scholars have mentioned, Al-Khattabi mentions, he says that, you know, the one that hopes for the reward is the one that, that does not feel a burden when fasting. Mustafqilin, thaqil means heavy. It is not a heavy burden on you. And غير mustaqilin fi ayam is like, oh man, it's going to be the 16 hour part of the year, man. All right, I guess I'll do this. Let's just, let's just get it over with, right? We really have to check ourselves and see this ihtisab. We're really hoping for the reward. We want this reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we know what it means because of that iman. We've established that relationship or we're trying to establish the relationship because of that iman that we have. So trying to establish it setting your alarm clock, looking at your calendars, saying, you know what, I'm going to make a change. Or this one thing that I'm going to be consistent on, which we'll talk about inshallah ta'ala. It is that motivation to get to a destination. Motivation, iman, the destination, ihtisab. And that is something that is so beautiful because when one is constantly yearning to get to that place or constantly yearning for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what's the reward? And what's interesting is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ghufira lahu ma taqaddam wa ma ta'akhar. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what previously, his previous and future sins will be forgiven. But for us, our previous sins will be forgiven, inshallah, if we have this motivation, trying to get to this destination, hoping for the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and standing in Ramadan in prayer, primarily tarawih, the last third of the night, and then also uh, uh, fasting in this beautiful month, and standing for Laylatul Qadr. This beautiful aspect of, of this motivation and, and destination is also so profound because when we look at our previous sins, you know, Sha'ban, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, had yaghfulu anhu min nas. He said that this is a month that many of uh, many people are negligent upon because it's between Rajab min Ashrul Hurum, the, the prohibited months, and also the month of Ramadan. It is the eighth month, Sha'ban. And he loved to fast this month and it, while his deeds were raised, what, while he was fasting. Because as scholars mentioned, Ibn Rajab and others, the Prophet Sallallahu always took advantage of doing actions of worship in times where people would be negligent. As we see in times of fitna. The Thulut Akhi ibn al the last third of the night. Sallu bil layli wa nasu niyam. Prayer at night when people are asleep trying to do actions of worship when the majority of people most likely may not be doing it. Now with that reality, let's look at the last 10 months because maybe Shabbat, alhamdulillah, you know, we, we fasted a good amount of it. We're, we're conditioning ourselves. We're doing a great job. But the past 10 months, when we look back, there definitely was some taqsir. There definitely was some negligence. There definitely was some sins that all of us have committed. 
And that's the beautiful wisdom behind that it was a, it's the passive tense of the verb that it was forgiven. Previous sins will be forgiven that we see uh, in this in this beautiful, beautiful hadith. But it's an encouragement for us to look at how we can initially motivate ourselves to continue on this act. And while we do this act of motivation, that we want the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to end by saying, I don't, I don't primarily like the word motivation a lot because it is something that is temporary. It's when you light the fire to motivate, but to keep it lit, you have to be disciplined. And discipline always outshines motivation. We're going to talk about that, about that in the light ta'ala. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that have this iman and ihtisab when standing in the month of Ramadan, standing on Laylatul Qadr, and fasting in this beautiful month, hoping for his reward that is endless and that cannot be domesticated to any shape, form, or fashion. Allahu Akbar. Absolutely beautiful. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Ghufir lahu ma taqaddam min lambihi. I never thought of the connection uh, between the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi forgiven for all of his previous and, and future sins, and we seek to be forgiven for all of our previous sins. May Allah reward you. Inshallah. We haven't heard much from Sister Lubna, Sheikh Ibrahim, so bismillah. <laughs> I, I thought, subhanAllah, you know, I was reflecting on this the other day that all of, uh, like the concept of fasting itself is all about building that iman and ihtisab. Because, you know, fasting differs from other actions in that you can't see someone fast. You know, we meet each other in Ramadan. I assume you're fasting. You assume I'm fasting. But really nobody knows if I'm sneaking off somewhere and eating some food and, and uh if you're doing the same, Allahu Alam, right? So in the end of the day, it's it's a secret between uh, us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only reason you would follow through on a fast is because you know that one day you're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One day you're going to, um, you know, get that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, nisa'imi farhatan, right? To the one who is fasting, they have two forms of joy. The joy when they break their fast, and the joy when they meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the only reason we would fast is because we have that iman that we're going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that this fast is going to have value. And so subhanAllah, it's a beautiful um, talk from Shaykh Abdullah that really all of it is building our iman and ihtisab or building our, our faith and our expecting of that reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. Sister Lubna, bismillah. Tafadlani. Jazakumullah khair. Um, but just to reflect uh, briefly on Sheikh Abdullah, I, I think that's uh, you know, a beautiful reminder uh, because I know for some of us, perhaps we've been fasting for many years. Uh, this was something that we we're used to doing. Um, and for others, uh, maybe we're entering the folds of Islam just recently, and maybe this is our first Ramadan. For some, maybe they were uh, born into Islam and um, maybe this is a practice they used to do when they were younger, but for some reason, this has been a time where they have fallen off of, of either salah or you know, prayer or, or, or fasting. And, and for some, um, I know there's some, you know, there's some jokes that go around about Ramadan Muslims, you know, but, but this, what you reminded us of, uh, Sheikh Abdullah, is that you know, it's never too late for us because with that iman and with that ihtisab, that can propel us to say, this is the Ramadan I'm going to turn around, you know, and all you can do is just start one day at a time. So, so it's really a, a blessed opportunity for, for those of us who are, you know, all of us are on our spiritual journey. Um, and for some of us who have really, you know, this is a time that we're just trying to come back from, uh, from a period of time and where we have, we've been heedless or we, perhaps we've been uh, uh, neglectful, I should say. I should say neglectful in, in our responsibilities towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What a, what a blessed opportunity we have to start and, and is never too late. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would never turn down uh, your efforts despite other people maybe judging you and saying, oh, you're just, you're just doing this you know, because it's Ramadan. So we, we should never belittle such a thing. And, and I hope uh, any of you out there that are watching and this is your, this is your time where you're really thinking, I, I wanna turn myself around. Alhamdulillah, grab onto this opportunity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, you know, inshallah, with that iman and ihtisab, it will reward you for it, inshallah. Um, I would just like to thank Allah Khair, Sister Lubna, and uh, Sheikh Abdullah and Sheikh Ibrahim for mentioning those things. I, I feel like the word ihtisab sometimes, like it, we could, we could, we could be in a position where we don't under, fully understand what it really means, ihtisab. And I found that the, the time where I fully understood what ihtisab meant was when I coupled it 
with another word which is called istihdar, right? And istihdar means being mindful, present-minded. So think about this for a second. What is the single most effective ingredient to benefit from your journey to Medina and Mecca? Khalas, this is, I, I believe this to be the top of the list. This is the single most effective ingredient in order to benefit. The more you have of this, the more you benefit, and the less you have, the less you benefit. Of course, everyone benefits, inshallah. And um, if, I'm not sure if Yaqeen knows this, but I think I'm like, I can call first on almost every video that comes out. Um, so the, the last video that came out, where it just came out a few minutes ago, and I was just walking to the, from my car to here, and I played it. What would you say to the Prophet Sallam if you've seen him? Sheikh Umar, you know, um, I mean, I'm sure most of you have even watched it yet, Sheikh Umar. I, I just I just watched it and I said, subhanAllah, this, this is, this is uh, something that you should think about, right? So here's, what is that one most, the most effective ingredient? And I believe uh, it is istihbar, being present-minded when you arrive in Madinat al-Munawwara, understanding that this is the same city, same soil that the Prophet once walked upon. These are the, this is the same mountain that the Prophet once saw. This is the same Kaaba where the Prophet saw with his tears, with his blood, which he hugged to, hugged on, which he, which he saw on the day of conquest of Mecca, which he saw when he was leaving Mecca. I mean, think about all these different things, and then you can feel it. And if you just look at the Kaaba, the Kaaba is it, it really, I mean, nobody, like nobody in the world would make a home like this. You know, it's it's just it's it's a structure there, and people, you know, the, there's the, the curtain of the Kaaba. But it has such an important, you know, it, has, it, it plays such a huge role in our lives. When I look at the Kaaba, and this is what my father taught me this, like you look at the Kaaba, you, I try to think of all the different times that the Prophet saw the Kaaba. And the Kaaba, and I, I, oh, I would say, if the Kaaba had a tongue, what would it say? Right? If the moon had a tongue, what would it say? If Ramadan could speak, what would it say? So have istihbar, be present. If you're present minded when you go to Medina and Mecca, you're able to benefit. And you kind of, that's why Imam Malik would never walk with his shoes in Medina Munawwara. So many people, they're so pretty, they're like, I hope I don't walk on the same place where the Prophet walked upon, right? And um, so I could speak about that some other day, but coming back to Ramadan, imagine, imagine Ramadan now, and imagine how the Prophet would interact with the month of Ramadan. And it's not like, you know, hunger was the order of the day before. It was not like they were just hungry in Ramadan. Hunger was the order of the day. They were hungry before and after. And the month of Ramadan came to them as, uh, as this gift. And, and they said, okay, this is an opportunity to really benefit from the treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his mercy. So they were so present-minded about every single moment. They, they said, the, the people of the past, you could literally count how many words they would say in the month of Ramadan because they wanted to live, capitalize on every single moment because it's not... Really, at that point, like it is tiles in front of you. It is this big structure of Mashnabwi. But they could look beyond that. You know, that's looking beyond that. Yes, it's a month of Ramadan. You know, Sheikh Ibrahim said, well, I don't know who you're fasting, if I'm fasting. But, you know, that's the truth. But look beyond that. Look at look at how much benefit you can have from this. And then that leads you to ihtisab. When you're present-minded, then it leads you to now understanding what the reward is. And I don't know um, if... I, if there's anyone more excited, honestly, to even though this Ramadan will be extremely tough for our family, because the first last Ramadan was the first Ramadan in which all of our brothers were together because there was COVID. And we let Tarawih, me, Sheikh Abdul Aziz, and Mullah Abdul Rahim, Sheikh Abdul Rahim, three of us, we let Tarawih and we read the whole Quran in my mother's house with my mother behind us and our, you know, my sister in law is my wife. And, you know, every after eight rakats, me and my, my, my Abdul, because I'm the tea guy in my house. So I make all the different types of teas. I act like I can make tea. You know, I make a lot of noise in the kitchen, break something, do this, and you know, pretend like I'm doing a lot. And so I, me and him used to make the tea, and he used to serve. And I could imagine. I just I can't even imagine how difficult it's gonna be for my mother and my father. And I know how difficult it's gonna be for myself. But at the same time, like this is another opportunity to really like, okay, this is we're gonna come this month of Ramadan with a broken heart, with a different type of feeling. And now we're going to try to get even more reward from it. Maybe this is the month which can completely heal us from our pain. That's that's how we're go- looking at this month. So, Sheikh Abdullah, like, thank you for mentioning the ihtisab part because I believe that it's coupled with istihdar. 
being mindful and present minded. If you don't have that, if you come to salah and you're not you're not present minded during salah, how can you be present minded enough to think seek the reward? So you have to be mindful that you're there, and then it leads to seeking the reward. That's a beautiful point you mentioned. It just reminded me about the we saw of the Prophet Sallallahu right? You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Wisal is where he would fast continuously. He wouldn't break his fast of the Maghrib. He would continue on for days fasting. And then some of the companions would do it. And, they, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked him why they're doing it. And they mentioned that really we see you to Asir. He said, And some of the scholars mentioned that it was because he was so mustahlir fi siyamihi. Just like you mentioned, he was someone that was so present that that wasn't even a thought. You know, subhanAllah. And as you mentioned, the alone time with the Irtikaf, and I highly implore Muslims to really, uh, you know, to make Irtikaf if, if possible. If it's not the 10 nights, one night between Maghrib and Isha, the scholars have mentioned just, you know, time on purpose, spending alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, when you, you reach a certain point to where you'll understand the whole concept of how the Prophet ﷺ made we saw it. because you're just, you're, 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 your mind is, and your soul is so, divided so undivided you're just really with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as you mentioned what I tell a lot of youth even new Muslims you know when you're praying and what do I think about when I pray and youth I tell you know I tell my sons I know sometimes you're you know you think you're not thinking about you know your prayer when you're in your prayer think about things that happened in your life and associate that to a name or action of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anything you know if it's something bad you've done al ghafur if it's something good good you've done you know al hamid you know you say alhamdulillah a shakur, just anything that's happened in your life. You know, when you see movies, you'll see scenes and things of that nature. So do the same thing when you're, when you're praying or when you're trying to focus on Allah. Think of things that have happened in your life, and that may help you be mustahdim, someone that is present uh, in, in the moment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not anything else. So jazakallah khair ala hadha ta'aliq on that point that you added, inshallah. Shaykh I cannot, I cannot relate with the example you gave me when you see movies. Like, what is that? Oh, here he goes again. You know what? <laughs> you know what, man? Just be honest. All right. How many, how many, how many you don't watch movies in English? That's all it is. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Refuses to watch movies in English. I've never seen the guy eat non desi food. Really? Mufti Abdul Rahman. Yeah. Like, he's that guy in Hajj that's like roasted chicken. What's this? You know, let me go find. <laughs> He's that guy. This guy only doesn't like like he's too good for Americano coffee. He's too good for <laughs> the key word for masking movies is documentary. We gotta say that. Khalas, then we have uh, talk about that's right, that's right. No, I'm sorry. Hey, hey. Sorry about that, but yeah, <laughs> Chef. Allah bless you. Um so, you know, inshallah, we've got just about 25 minutes or so left. So I want to, uh, let's kind of go through sort of our final advices, but, our, but, but you know, we really haven't heard much yet from Sheikh Ibrahim, Ustad Lubna. So um, I know both of you, inshallah, have a very specific message for us. Then we can kind of just end off and I'll try not to, hopefully Mufti Abdul Rahman won't say anything that provokes a reaction, we'll kind of keep it keep it the way that it is uh but by the way one thing before i hand it back off inshallah the ad um uh or the, or the video that just went out um on the uh on the meeting the prophet saw them um that is, is a very that was a very beautiful experience for me personally so i actually interviewed people and i had these questions i first put them in medina i said have you ever been to medina and then um started to then ask them okay well do you think the prophet saw someone wanted to meet you and it's like me and then it's like yes he actually did want to meet you and then after that, okay, well, what will you say when you meet him? So it's a, it was, it was a beautiful experience to ask a, a diverse group of people uh, those questions. So please do watch that video, inshallah. It just got released actually before uh, the webinar and benefit from it. Bidnidah. And to remind everyone, uh, the Greet Ramadan with Sadaqa uh, link is in the description, inshallah. So please do, inshallah, consider uh, being a Yaqeen supporter as always. Uh, and your donation will be processed on the first of Ramadan. And with that, inshallah ta'ala, Ustada Lubna, uh, Bismillah, your final advice and words for us as we're going to Ramadan, and then we'll go to Sheikh Ibrahim, inshallah, and uh, give everyone just a few words to end off, inshallah. Inshallah, Jazakallah khair. And Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah. Totally been enjoying the back and forth conversation, alhamdulillah, benefiting, alhamdulillah. 
And uh, as um, so I like this, you know, fine nuance, you know, not really movies, but documentaries, right? It's all in the wording. And that ties in nicely to what I was going to talk about, inshallah, kind of. Um, you know, one of the things uh, 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 Sister Sara, alhamdulillah, mentioned, you know, kind of the, the inner reflection and the, and the inner type of, of worship that we want to be doing uh, when it comes to husna dhan about other people. And that can help us when it comes to husna dhan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, Sheikh Abdullah uh, reminded us about, you know, uh, our worship in that hadith talking about fasting, prayer, and then uh, uh, qiyam in particular, and then prayer in Laylatul Qadr, during Laylatul Qadr, inshallah. Um, you know, and another form of worship that I would like us to think about is, is our mu'amalat, is our dealings with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. So part of our, you know, uh, uh, you know, responsibility towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing the, the, the acts that he has commanded us to do. And that's between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it comes to fasting, when it comes to prayer, uh, when it comes to sadaqah, zakat. Of course, sadaqah benefits people, but alhamdulillah, this is, we're dealing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the ways in which we uh, deal so often, and yet maybe we're not so mindful of, is when we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. How are we speaking to them? You know, and this very brief, concise hadith from Ibn, uh, Anas ibn Malik, rahimahullah, uh, radio anhu, I should say, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. You know, as we know that uh, from the age of 10, that uh, he lived with Prophet Muhammad uh, uh, his mom, um, you know, asked that he could serve Prophet Muhammad so he could learn for him, from him. And he lived with him for 10 years, I should say. And, and one of the things that he reflected upon in the character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was that uh, he mentioned that uh, Rasulullah, peace and blessings be upon him, never said uff to him. Never once said uff. And he also continued and said, and he never said harshly, why did you do that? Or why did you not do that? And it, it's, to me, this speaks volumes, subhanAllah. It really speaks volumes. Because when you translate, you know, we can say uff, you know, maybe some of us say that today when, uh, somebody asks us to do something or it's in response to something maybe it wasn't very nice uh, uh, that somebody says, but, you know, we can do that in terms of an eye roll, uh, shrugging our shoulders, a hand flip, like whatever or whatever, you know, uh, subhanAllah, there's so many ways in which we can do that. And if we were to only reflect upon how Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with people, you know, here he's dealing with a youth. He's dealing with somebody who's serving him, dealing with somebody in the privacy sometimes of his own home. And here is where, you know, we see in many ways, of course, we see Prophet Muhammad's character um, shine because he was not the type of individual that only when he was in the market, he was very kind because everyone's going to see him or only as a statesman in his meetings that uh, Prophet Muhammad would be, you know, um, you know, moral and use good words and, and be kind to, to uh, individuals or do the right thing. Um, you know, it wasn't just in Dawa. He was who he was, which was an amazing individual, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, always exhibiting good character, not only in public, but also in private. And, and I, 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 this is something I would like to always work upon, you know, work on myself and a, a reminder for, for all of us today, inshallah, that actually it's our private, you know, our, our private interactions with those who are around us the most. Those are probably the interactions you want to be the most aware of because you're on your best guard when, you, when you're outside, when you're at work. Um, but perhaps due to, you know, we're tired uh, at the end of the day, um, we feel the most comfortable, we love these people the most, yet sometimes these are the people that we can tend to just kind of let our guard down and, and just say whatever. So how, how amazing is it? And there's so many times where we could point something out, especially the second part of the hadith. Why did you do that? Or why did you not do that? You know, you see, you see the trash cans outside and you tell your child, why didn't you put them in the trash? Or didn't I tell you not to play video games? You should be praying, didn't I? You know, why didn't you do this? Or why did you do that? SubhanAllah, you know, we have uh, 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 a narration from Ennis ibn Malik when he, uh, one time uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, sent him, out, sent him out on an errand and told him to do the errand and to uh, not get caught up and play in the street, you know, not to delay this errand. And um, of course, what happened as a youth uh, and as he, uh, who he went out and he saw kids playing in the street uh, and, and he started playing and he forgot. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa came up to him from behind. He put his hand on the shoulder. He did not say, 
what are you doing playing? And he did not say, why did you not already do? He just asked him knowing that he had not finished the errand. He said, did you complete the errand? And then Anas said, I'm going right now. I love his answer too. <laughs> I love Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's, you know, question. It wasn't why didn't you or why did you? It was, did you do it? Giving, giving Ennis the honorable opportunity, right? To speak with dignity for himself. He didn't have to be ashamed. He didn't have to be put down. It wasn't a criticism. He says, I'm doing it right now. Just, it, subhanAllah, we can learn volumes from this type of interaction. It shows dealing with other people with kindness, even though you have the authority, whether you're in a business situation, whether you're in a family situation, you're a mentor, you're a parent, or as a child as well. You know, you think, uh, you know, um, you know, my parents or uh, maybe you're caring for elders or maybe, you know, you're in different situations where you think you can just answer in any way, because especially in Ramadan, you're tired, maybe you're hungry, uh, maybe you're having that uh, uh, before uh, before Maghrib headache that I always get, alhamdulillah, or I shouldn't say always, I quite often get, and you just feel like you can respond in any way, but this is a reminder for us that even when you have the authority or the position uh, uh, to just kind of respond in any way that you really be mindful. And I like the, the word that uh, um, uh, uh, our beloved Sheikh uh, uh, reminded us of um, istihdar, that mindfulness, that mindfulness. Uh, you know, if we're mindful of our words, uh, Sheikh Abdurrahman, if we're mindful of our words, if we're, if we're really thinking and we're, we're having taqwa, we're thinking about, is what I'm about to say pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Um, is what I'm about to say, is it displeasing to him? If we're mindful, then we are able to take our character to the next level and really uh, choose our words wisely. Um, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam also mentioned in another hadith um, to speak good or keep silent. Speak good or keep silent. So um, if you know what you're going to say is not, you know, it's just kind of a little bit of attitude. It's, it's maybe there's some validity in it, but it's not gonna come off in the right way. Delay it. And maybe when you're in a better situation, you can think of a better thing to say, um, to address a real situation. The timing is also important. Then you can uh, speak, um, but otherwise silence is golden. And the last thing uh, that I wanted to mention was really interesting. And, you know, this is this psychology uh, of, of, you know, neg negative talk, you know, whether it's a self-criticism, you know, for every negative uh, self-criticism uh, that you think of in your head, it takes five to six times positive thoughts about yourself to overcome that. And the same ratio is really interesting. At least is the research that, that I've read, you know, as a, as a lay person, um, but that in business, that the most successful teams are the ones in which management had like a 5.6 ratio of negative, you know, criticisms, you know, this is probably not a good idea, you know, obviously it's said in the right way, but it's still considered negative that, that their, their positive comments outweigh the negative 5.6 to one. It's really powerful, subhanAllah, and here we see it in action. So inshallah, we take this opportunity to be not only mindful of our worship in terms of, you know, when we're fasting and when we're praying, but also mindful in how we deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Sheikh Ibrahim? <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. You know, um, just to give, inshallah, some... Uh, reflection that I had recently, just dealing with my community as we're coming into Ramadan. And, uh, you know, one of the things that has been, um, that I've been thinking about is, you know, we talk about some of the amazing examples of the righteous people when it came to this month of Ramadan, that, you know, for instance, Uthman radiallahu an recited the Quran, all of it in one rakah uh, during Ramadan. Um, that Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, and it was also narrated Imam Malik, uh, would do khatma of the Qur'an once every three days. And I think that those stories are so motivational if you're in the realm of their ibadah, right? If you're somebody who can do two khatma of the Qur'an, you know, do the khatma of the Qur'an twice in Ramadan, then you read these stories and you're like, you know what, maybe I can do once a week. But the problem is we have a lot of people in our community, they've never read the Qur'an cover to cover. And they'll hear some of these stories and it has a demotivating factor for them. And so I find that people sometimes fall into two categories where one of them is they think that, you know what, these examples are way beyond me. I'm demotivated. There's no way I can accomplish anything in Ramadan. So I'm not even going to try it because I know I'm going to fail. And the other kind of person is the one who says, you know what, let me try. 
if other people could do it, I'll do it too. And they go as hard as they can. And they, you know, are praying and reciting Quran as much as they can. They do one night, two nights, three nights, and then they all burn out. And all of us know this. Anybody who's been at the masjid, we see the dip happening after a week of Ramadan, people stop showing up. And, and we know that's the case. And so, you know, there's been amazing lessons that everybody's been sharing today. The one lesson that I just want people to know is, you know, the most important thing you can do for yourself entering Ramadan to prepare yourself for this month is to figure out things that you can do that are consistent, that you can consistently carry on during the month. And the Prophet ﷺ was asked, we know, he was asked, what is the best deed? He said, what is consistent amongst the deeds, even if it's a little bit. And another hadith, the Prophet ﷺ spoke to the people. He said, He said, do of the actions of the good deeds, that which you're capable of enduring, that which you're actually capable of doing. Like, don't take on so much that you know you're not capable of doing it and that you're going to burn out because of it and you're going to end up not being able to take advantage of this month. And then he said, and indeed, Allah does not tire until the servant tires, meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tire of rewarding you, of giving you, until you tire out completely, right? And so if you're doing something, and then he said, and indeed, Allah loves the most the actions that are consistent. So if we're consistently doing something, even if it's small, even if it's not a lot, if we're consistently doing it throughout the month, then Allah is consistently rewarding us. And if we do so much in the beginning and we try to do all that we can and then we burn out real quick, what's happening is that Allah is rewarding you in the beginning and then he's not rewarding you through the other days. And so that's something that's really important for us to think about as we're entering into this month. And, you know, there's, a, there's an interesting story of the Prophet wasallam when he entered into the masjid and he saw a rope tied uh, between two pillars. So he asked the people, what is this rope for? They said, this rope is for Zainab, for the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ, that she used to pray to Hajjud. And sometimes she prayed so much that she was afraid basically of falling. So she would lean onto this rope and hold onto the rope. So they put this rope there so that she can hold onto it while she's praying. When the Prophet ﷺ heard this, he said, untie the rope. Don't let her have this rope. He said, if she's tired, she should stop. The Prophet ﷺ was mindful of people taking on more than they're capable of too quickly, right? And so when we look at the example of the Prophet, we say we want to have a Ramadan like our Prophet ﷺ. The methodology of the Prophet ﷺ is to build himself up with consistent actions over time. So it's easy to look at the Prophet and see all the ibadah that he's doing and trying to do it right away, recreate it right away. But that was not the method of the Prophet. The Prophet built himself up in his ibadah slowly with consistent actions. And so we need to follow that same methodology. And the scholars, they say, you know, a beautiful statement, Rahimallahu that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mercy on a person who knows themselves. And so one of the best things you can do coming into Ramadan is know yourself. Who are you, right? And what are you capable of doing? What is, you know, Ramadan comes and it upends our routines, our life changes, it forces us out of our comfort zone. So Ramadan should force you out of your comfort zone. But what is an achievable, reasonable thing to do outside of your comfort zone, right? If you rarely read the Quran, can you make it a reasonable goal to recite half of a page a day? Right? Is that reasonable for you? Is that something that you're capable of doing? You need to ask yourself, know what you are capable of doing and push yourself to go a little bit outside of your own comfort zone. And the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, Salawatul Khams wa Jum'ah al Jum'ah wa Ramadan illa Ramadan, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, you know, the five daily prayers in Jum'ah to Jum'ah and Ramadan to Ramadan, Mukhaffarat lima baynahuma, that they are expiating of the sins that are between them. And, you know, when you read this, it makes you think that you should be evaluating your Jum'ah to Jum'ah. So every week you should evaluate your week, every Jum'ah. And every Ramadan, you should evaluate one Ramadan to the other, right? What did I do last Ramadan? How can I make this Ramadan 5%, 10% better, 15% better, right? What, what did I do last year to do better? And the people who really benefit from Ramadan are the ones who every year Ramadan to Ramadan is getting a little bit better, getting a little bit better. And so, inshallah, that's just my, my little advice. And, you know, finally, the Prophet said, uh, قَارِبُ وَسَدِّدُوا Right? You know, be moderate in your actions and try to be as close as you can. As in the Prophet I'm saying, you're not going to be perfect. Nobody's going to be perfect. Don't give up on your deeds because it's not perfect, because it will never be perfect. Rather, just keep trying, keep doing as much as you can consistently. Even if you fail, just keep trying again, because it will never be perfect. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can still give us from his mercy and enter us into Jannah because of our actions in this moment. Zakallahu khairan, Sheikh Ibrahim. And subhanAllah, um, you know, I, I, I really appreciate the, the bridge. Um, Sister Lubna, you talked about the importance of us trying harder to be kind. And, and, you know, it's not easy sometimes. And if we can be consistent in our behavior, like there's no way you go through 30 days of being so mindful of the way that you talk to people uh, that uh, you just go right back into it after Ramadan. And the same thing is true, I think, with our regimen of ibadah. You're not going to carry the same portion, but you can carry the same um, motivation, the same the same habits to a lesser extent after uh, Ramadan bin the night uh, to resemble the Prophet Sallallahu uh, most often. Inshallah Ta'ala, as we're, as we're coming towards the end, uh, just to remind everyone once again about the Greet Ramadan with Sadaqah campaign. And I just want to say this, uh, Inshallah, you might have noticed, Alhamdulillah, it was with the support that we got last Ramadan uh, in particular, that we were able to produce multiple series this year, alhamdulillah. So Yaqeen, the Yaqeen team grew and our content grew. We had prophetic parenting, Sheikh Ibrahim, uh, Sheikh Abdullah uh, did uh, his, his series on pillars. Uh, you know, Sister Sara continued, mashallah, the wonderful work on, um, you know, on, on trauma and the series there, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And we've, we've been able to grow and grow and grow and grow. And uh, Mufti Abdurrahman, series on Iqbal and Urdu, uh, Urdu poetry. That's not out yet. We, we should do a, a high quality series though with you uh, doing some, finally let the Urdu come out inshallah. But Anastada Lubna of course has been a, a constant presence as a board member as well. But, but we've been able to produce so much alhamdulillah. And that's the idea that uh, the more inshallah ta'ala uh, support we get, the more that we can continue to crank out free resources inshallah for the benefit of the community. So please do consider supporting us just as you did last year and bidnillahi ta'ala if you can do more you can do more and share with others the link inshallah ta'ala and with the last uh seven minutes that we have i'm going to go around and ask for one minute it's really hard for us to talk in one minute uh or i'll just say me um i'll say me and mufti abdul rahman uh, everyone else mashallah knows how to talk in one minute but we uh, sheikh abdullah just give you the facial expression and that'll tell you everything that you need to know and I was going to ask Ustad Lubna, by the way, does this count as part of Uf? Because if it is, then <laughs> Sheikh Abdullah is in trouble. He does a lot of face palming. Well, he does it while smiling. So, mashallah, uh -huh. I think it's a good one. It's a good one, alhamdulillah. <laughs> so, let's go around. So, Sheikh Abdullah, tafadl, give us one minute, sort of last advice, word of advice uh, to everyone, inshallah. Uh, you're muted, Sheikh. I wasn't serious about just needing a face palm. I want to hear you, man. Bismillah. Uh, you know, subhanAllah, as I was just thinking of, um, you know, Ibn Qayyim, he mentions in Wabi al uh, one of his books, uh, a beautiful book, um, just talking about the importance of dhikr primarily. Uh, the first part of it, he mentions a lot of really interesting points about istiqama and being upright and how the, how the heart can be upright. He mentions something very beautiful. We kind of touched on it in the beginning, Sheikh Omar kind of touched on it in regards to sins and how sins can be a blessing, how? Because when you ponder over your sin, you feel so much regret and that can assist you in being more of a mukhlis and being sincere. And that's the reality of Toba. Toba is tab is to return to something. So you're kind of turning away from that sin because you feel so bad about it that you are so sincere in the dua, as opposed to in a time of rakha, in time of ease, you make dua, which is not, which is, which is preferred, which is, which is great. But when you think about that sin in prayer and something that you did weeks ago, you know, a month ago, a year ago, a decade ago, you pondering over that sin is one of the strongest means for you to be a mukhlis, to be sincere. So just taking advantage of this, this Ramadan now, even now, and just thinking about subhanAllah doing a roll call, you know, while you're in salah and anytime, you know, especially when you're alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the time you know that you had a grudge with somebody and you 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 refused you saw them far away they didn't see you and you didn't want to walk that way to give them salams you know the person that you know as you as a father you as a mother that you said you raised your voice and you saw the facial expression on your son but you wanted to remain the parent and didn't want to show some type of apology or show that you had some form of regret because you want to remain that authoritative have that authoritative nature within the house even though you know it's not right or the time that you you know, knew that you would not be consistent in something, but you overwhelmed yourself because you wanted to impress people, right? Each and every one of us has fallen into that. So I would just say, look 
over those sins that you have, especially in times where you are alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sheikh Abdul Rahim mentioned, Abdul mentioned, when you are alone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do a roll call every single night and just see where have I been deficient. And inshallah, that can be a means of you increasing your iman and hoping for the ultimate reward from him, inshallah ta'ala. Sister Sara. Jazakumullah khairan. You know, as I was uh, hearing both Ustaz Alubna and Sheikh Ibrahim speak, um, the, the tip I'd like to give is more dedicated to the parents uh, out there. Being a mother and hearing the things that, that, that you were all um, sharing. You know, a lot of Ramadan, one thing that's so powerful about it is that it builds our distress tolerance. It builds our distress tolerance in the ability to tolerate difficult situations because you're physically depriving yourself of something that you normally wouldn't de deprive yourself of. And so your window of tolerance can increase. And so, you know, kind of tying that into what uh, Ustaz Alubna was saying about kind treatment toward other others, you know, we build our, our physical distress tolerance, but let's build our emotional distress tolerance as well, you know. And so thinking about the example of Rasulullah in the way that he treated everybody, including those who, you know, he had so much power over um, and us as parents, you know, thinking about our children this Ramadan and trying to make it a very positive experience by building that distress tolerance and being able to, you know, withstand some of the struggles that come through, pausing for a moment, tying into that theme of mindfulness we were talking about um, and pausing for just that present moment and deciding, how do I want my child to remember this moment and realizing this is part of Ramadan in my Ramadan experience and my connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also in the experience of my child's Ramadan as well, inshallah. Barakallahu uh, fiki. Sheikh Ibrahim, give me a tweet, like a tweetable quote, man. Advice, like quick, like. Yaqeen bites. <laughs> yeah, give me a yaqeen bite. You know, I just want to, inshallah, maybe just mention what the brothers had talked about earlier about having hudur and fushua in this month. And, you know, the, when we say the word fushua, what does it mean? We could talk for a long time about its definition. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he uses the word in, in one verse, وَخَشَعَةٍ أَصْلَاتُ الرحمن talks about the day of judgment. That all the, the sound will be khasha'at, you know, quiets down in front of Rahman, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, it's interesting because part of khushua, I think, is really a churn, we're churning down the volume of everything else in this world that doesn't matter to us and only listening to our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so as we enter this month and we want to have that presence and that connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should have that mindfulness, that khushua, where we just look at all the things that are not useful for us in this world and try to turn that down that volume in this month and focus only on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. MashaAllah, that's so tweetable. Turn the volume down. Zakmullah khair. Stab al-Ubna. Zakmullah khair. And my, inshallah, quick advice is, uh, you know, everybody um, has a different life situation and, and it doesn't change during Ramadan. So you have the single mom, you know, who's, who's you know, trying to hold the fort down, doing everything. You have uh, people taking care of maybe their elderly parents. You have students that are in the, the you know, the throes of, of, of completing a, a, a thesis or what have you. Um, and you have people, you know, maybe who are taking care of small children. So your Ramadan is not going to look like everybody else's, you know, and, and I think we can still benefit and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will still accept from us whatever it is that we're able to do so plan your Ramadan according to your life situation of course push yourself and set those uh, lofty goals um, but this is not a time to feel bad because of a life situation that you're in that you can't change and just uh, adjust your Ramadan goals accordingly inshallah MashaAllah awesome Mufti Saab listen this is not like when you stand up after Maghrib and say I'm going to be five minutes and it goes 15-20 minutes all right please one minute. That, that's, you got it wrong. It's, it's the Elan that says it'll be a short <laughs> option. It's never short. No sign right. up. No, no long talk. Just give us a minute. Bismillah. Oh. And English, please. Speak English, Sheikh. Please. Oh, come on, man. I speak English, inshallah. So I would say that um, something that we can work on this Ramadan is our end of our fast, which is the iftar time. Right. What happens is sometimes we build up on our momentum, our spirituality, and at that moment, we we forget that we are not supposed to save our portions of food for one time and eat more. Rather, 
we're supposed to, the, the point of Ramadan is try to eat less so we can make that the way of our life. Aisha Lana says, and a beautiful, she says, beautiful, beautiful um, statement of her. She said, Inna awwala bala'in hadatha fi hadil ummah ba'da qala'i nabiyyiha ash-shibah. The first thing that went wrong in this in ummah after the Prophet left this world was people started customarily, habitually eating to their full always. فَإِنَّ الْقَوْمِ لَمَّا شَبِعَتْ بُطُونُهُمْ When people eat to their full, سَمِنَتْ أَبْدَانُهُمْ Of course you get unhealthy, your body gets bigger. فَتَصَعَبَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَجَمَحَتْ شَهْوَاتُهُمْ Another place, فَقَصَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Then the hearts become hard and our craves become very, uh, our, our craves become overpowering. So we always have to go, we, we're not, if, if we're sitting there after iftar, we ate so much, now we're like, ah, oh, just stay here. I'm not sure if I go for tarawih. I'm not sure about ibadah. And so I would say that, you know, if we can really, it's not that hard. If we could make it easy upon ourselves. Oh, my son, when the when we when you eat to your full to your neck where you can't even move, then the the vision a person has uh, it goes to sleep. You can't think about things anymore properly. You lose wisdom. And the limbs of your body become weak and they sit down and they cannot worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. So I would say that um, try to at iftar and suhoor understand that Yusuf al Islam used to say that when he was asked, why do, you always, why do you stay hungry more often? And he said that I stay hungry because I don't want to become insensitive to the people who are always hungry. So I want to stay in that state. So I would say one thing we could do is uh, try to eat uh, less at iftar and suhoor. Give it a shot. It's very powerful. And at nighttime, you can stand for a more ibadah and cry easier. Because the more you eat, the, the heart becomes harder. It becomes harder to do good. All of what we said right now would be just so easy if we just um, relied on sufficient provision only. Jazakallah khair. Exactly. I had I had a timer on, but I accidentally put it for one hour, not one minute. <laughs> I was going to say that that's not 57 seconds. So that... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I saw Sheikh Omar like this. He was. He was like, <laughs> look, I, I, I'm serious. I, I put it on for one hour rather than one minute. I'm sorry. I, I would have stopped earlier. Forgive me. I <laughs> love yeah, bless you. Um, we I, I enjoyed everyone's input uh, tremendously, and I'm sure we all did. Jazakumullah khairan to all of you uh, for for such valuable input today. Um, and inshallah ta'ala, we pray for a blessed Ramadan, a Ramadan Mubarak for, for everyone, bidnanahi ta'ala. May Allah accept from us all. Allahumma ameen. And inshallah, I want to remind you all, uh, again, please go, uh, please share this webinar, first of all. Make sure that you press share, where, whatever platform you're using, inshallah ta'ala, make sure you spread it, because I personally benefited quite a bit, alhamdulillah, I mean, from everyone um, here. So please do share the webinar, inshallah, and please do watch the, the video that was just released uh, interviewing people about the Prophet wasallam, and then get your hearts ready for this Ramadan experience that we'll have with Yaqeen uh, doing tafsirah and doing meeting Muhammad wasallam on a daily basis. And finally, inshallah ta'ala, uh, asking you once again to please consider supporting Yaqeen this Ramadan along with the other wonderful efforts. If you click the link below, your donation will process bid the night on the first of Ramadan. And Jazakumullah Khairan, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, Ashadu al-la ilaha al-ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.